What is up, Rad Potential YouTube? Welcome to today's video. I'm telling you, somebody went and turned the heater off in Tennessee because it's cold now. It's like barely October. Back in the shop, working on Death Trap, the turbo first gen magic. Gonna be a sick track car slash streetable ish first gen. Now, a lot of questions about the suspension setup. We're kind of going to dive into that in this video. The front of this car has a re-speed rack and pinion, which I mentioned before. I'm going to show it to you from afar right now. In the video, we'll get into more depth. We've got to take the factory 1979 SA transmission out. Yes, this car was turbo 13B with an FC engine. And we're still using, or were still using, the original 12A 1979 transmission. You can put an NA clutch bolts right in that needs to go not good enough gear ratios can't spin enough rpm through a stock transmission we'll break it at least i will break it because i've broken three of them in my 1980 rx7 with a bridge port so the next thing the rear end has a gslse axle you guys are like it's five lug right which we're going to take these bbs wheels off and drop all the suspension out of this car in this video it has a stock four lug gslse axle the axle flange is big enough you can drill it for five look that's all that's done back here it's just a re-drilled axle flange which i'll show you here in a second while we're back there as well we're going to drop the fuel tank out and pull everything basically out of the back of the car there's some rust we're going to find that rust look at it in this video assess the stock suspension learn about first gens let's get started but first things first if you have these sweet bbs wheels and you don't have the super cool bbs remove your wheel tool i'll fast forward through this then you're sleeping you gotta have just you know you have enough rx7s you be around verts you acquire one of these and you just don't sell it with the car so that you can take these wheel hub caps off how they're supposed to come off oh this one's stuck there it is look at that man we need some longer plug studs those aren't long enough that barely holds that wheel is there a spacer in here there is a spacer in there we need some longer lug studs I don't like that take the back off that is proper lug stud length right there. Look at that. Shifters out. And this is a big reveal right here. Look at the horsepower gains. The amount of rad potential in getting rid of this exhaust is astronomical. We're trying to cram all this rotary horsepower and boost out of a, like a Prius exhaust. It's like inch and an eighth. We can just take this thing right out here. We'll just put that in the scrap pile. We don't need any of it. Ouch. All right, guys, here's one of the, uh, few reasons that can cause your rear iron to, iron to break detonation things with inside the engine definitely could probably cause that but uh this is definitely not helping that situation look at how wasted this bushing is stock rubber bushing Transmission wiggles a whole bunch. Solid engine mounts. 
transmission flexes, engine stays put, got to break something, break the rear iron because it's the front cover stronger than the rear iron. All right, guys, we've got the axle out, gas tank out, transmission out, all sorts of stuff ripped out from underneath the car. So let's review the suspension on this car. We'll start at the back, then we'll talk about the rack and pinion stuff in the front. So a few things to note about first-generation RX-7s is that they have a parallel-ish four-link in the back with Watts Link. If you don't know what a Watts Link is, I'll show you. Where's my light? Y'all can see what's going on good enough. Okay. So, parallel four link, effectively. It's the goal, right? You got four suspension links. The bottom one's here, here, upper one here, and here. Everyone always complains, and it's kind of true, that these rear ends bind up whenever you try to load the rear end this way. You try to create body roll. You want the axle to articulate side to side. They bind up and they get stuck. I have a really good video on the rally car with it on the rotisserie showing you this with an empty axle housing and the suspension. So go check that out. But I'll explain it in short here. Everyone blames this Watts link because it's off center. So the center of the diff is here. The upper link is longer than the lower link. And they think that when this axle pivots because it's articulating side to side about its center point between the parallel four links that the watts link is causing it to bind however i'm gonna say that they are mostly wrong and that that's not where their issues are coming from okay your issue is coming from this upper link in the suspension all right this upper link is not straight this is not a true parallel four link in this car it's like a parallel two link with a bent upper four link thing so here's your not so parallel parallel four link okay i just have a punch i'll hold it straight in the center of the lower link you can see that the lower link is inboard of the mounting point for the upper link on the axle but is straight in line with the mounting point for the upper link on the chassis now, if you can imagine, this straight line is now your axle, okay? When your car body rolls, this is going to try to twist side to side, right? Your axle, which I'm showing you now perpendicular to what I was, your axle is articulating like this. What's that going to do to these joints? It's going to try to twist these, okay? It's going to try to twist this joint side to side. Now, from the factory, these have rubber bushings in them. Those rubber bushings allow for a little bit of deflection, but not a lot. So now if you can imagine these two being off center like this, and this upper link, when it's going to try to twist, right? When you try to twist this, it's going to put more leverage on these bushings because of that angle. And this upper link is going to cause your binding. Okay? Sorry, I bumped it exhaust heat shield and it's the worst sound ever this is what causes the binding because when i try to twerk this over all right this doesn't just twist the bushings it bends the whole thing which then causes the metal to hit the bracket up in here now you'll be like well wouldn't the lower one do that too well it's the fact that they don't do it together that these are different so when this twists it's allowed more deflection when this twists the angle makes more deflection than what the lower one does. Does that kind of make sense? The top one, because of the angle, will twist and affect this joint more than this one when it twists. The softer this bushing is, the more the sleeve that's inside of it 
can move back and forth, which allows the axle to load up sideways like your body rolled and still travel up and down. Because that's the ultimate thing that the binding is causing is the axle body rolls at an angle and then you hit a bump and it's frozen. Because it's body rolled, it can't move up and down in its travel. That's effectively why or what happens whenever this binds up and you spin out and hit a wall or go into a ditch and roll your rally car. So that's that. What are we going to do to fix this? There's kits out there. You can make your own, do whatever. You put a pan hard bar on this, it doesn't fix it. I've driven cars that have a pan hard bar with the stock four links and they handle the exact same as if the Watts link was in it, right? Now you just have all this extra bracket, bracketry crap down here and your axle, because it has a pan hard bar, moves side to side under the car, okay? The Watts link doesn't do that so much. The best way to fix this, if you're like wanting max travel, rally car status, is to take this upper link and make it straight. So you're gonna see kits like T3, T3 sells a kit that mounts from the part on the axle here, stock location on the axle, to the outside of the chassis up here. All right. Look out though. By moving this pickup point to the outside of the chassis, you make this bar straight, not at an angle, which allows it to rotate more when the axle rotates, not bind up. Now, the only problem with that, and I would say for some street applications it's probably okay, is that if you sleeve this and bolt this on here, that upper link is in single shear, which means only one side of that bolt is holding it. And I don't like that. For a street car you're just cruising around, that's probably fine, but as soon as you start pushing really hard, it's an aluminum upper, you've got heim joints on it now, and it's just, I wouldn't trust that. I'm sure they've tested it, but I wouldn't trust that. I would want this to be in double shear, which would mean like building a bracket that comes off and holding this up. And you can really see, this side doesn't have that much min rot, the other side does. Now, you can go through and simply heim joint everything, and that axle will articulate a lot better right, but you're gonna get a lot more noisy of a rear end, and I don't think that that's necessarily the best thing to do for a street car, right, it's gonna wear out. So I would keep the rubber bushings. The other thing is, you can take and remove the rear sway bar, okay? I personally would remove the rear sway bar on every first gen that has stock or poly bushings in it. Um, it allows the car to rotate, it allows it to rotate more, which then just instead of having to try to keep the axle flat, the car rotates, the car, the body roll, you know, the axle rotates over, and then you hit a bump and it's stuck. What that rear sway bar delete does, or removing it, is it allows the car to rotate further, okay, and help distribute the weight. And I don't know, I've just felt that the suspension travel functions better with the rear sway bar removed at one of those limiting you know, when you're at full tilt one way or the other. But try it. Literally, it's free. You can undo two bolts, drop the link out, go drive your car, see if you like it, put it back on, go try it if you have a first gen. But I would remove it on every single car ever. We're going to try the rear sway bar on this car because it has a racing beat, super stiff, fancy adjustable one. We're going to see how I like it at the track. But most likely, I can almost guarantee it, the first track day, I'm disconnecting it. So that's the rear suspension and a little bit of some rear suspension science for you guys. And if you guys have better ways around and you've got testing and time and road race and this, that, and the other, and you know and have a good setup for the rear, comment below because I want to know about it. I want to learn about this stuff and I want to find the best way to do this and also be able to advise you all the best way to do this. So I'm going to be building my own upper link, putting it in double shear. That'll be a heim joint. The rest of everything will be poly bushings. Like I said, it's a street slash track car. It doesn't need to be full rip stiff. But the other thing that I'd like to test with this other set of links is take a set of poly bushings and drill a bunch of holes in it. 
so it's softer and see if I can feel a difference with really soft on that di uh, diagonal upper link. So this is the moment that y'all have all been waiting for is seeing the re-speed rack and pinion conversion up close. Now, this is not available for purchase new. This is, you got to find one used and that's pretty much it. But this is what it looks like from up here. Okay, we'll kind of go through it. So this is a Flaming River rack. It looks pretty much like a Fox Body Mustang aftermarket rack or something you would find for a Mustang II front suspension conversion for hot rods. Go look it up. Super great conversion. Uses like 5x114 stuff, Mustang brakes. It's super easy. Do a wishbone deal. This is basically that rack. Now, this subframe uses stock lower control arms. You can see there's a couple bolt holes down there in order to help change your geometry, adjust your track width, this, that, and the other. Now, it's set to what looks like the maximum wide setting, but also is the middle pickup point. So I don't know what geometry that necessarily means, but that's where it's set right now. You can see that there is a brace that goes between the frame rails behind the engine now. Okay, that brace is because there is no more tension rods. If you look here, we have no tension rods. We have compression rods in the back. If you go and look on YouTube, there's a guy named Frank Kelly. He has a car called uh, Little Blue or Baby Blue. It's a Ford Escort, um, Mark II Escort with a Millington four-cylinder engine. It's like a $50,000, super awesome Cosworth-based four-cylinder engine. They're so good. 10,000 RPM of awesome. Maybe better than a rotary, but it's awesome. Um, his Escort, he talks a lot about the difference in handling between having a McPherson strut setup, which is what this is, okay, one thing with the shock, uh, one control arm with the shock, and um, running a tension rod up in the front or a compression rod in the back. And he actually switches between compression or tension rods based on the surface he's racing on. So if he's racing gravel, he runs tension rods. If he's racing tarmac, he runs compression rods. And he kind of walks through why and this, that, and the other that that's set up. Now, this kit, you really couldn't run a tension rod with how the knuckle is. It would have to be some kind of custom deal to clear the, uh, the tie rod here because the tie rod kind of runs right through where the tension rod went. You know, they went to compression on this kit because from the factory in RX-7 is rear steer, right? Your drag link and everything is behind the axle. This kit makes it front steer. So now your knuckle points forward and your rack and pinion is in, is in front of the axle. Now, Charles had mentioned, you know, on this kit to me that he had to switch the knuckles when he swapped to these 15 inch BBS wheels. My guess is, which this car had uh, 16 inch, the red and black rotas that have been around on it, and you saw it in the pictures, that with the 16s, this had a knuckle that went forward and out, okay, closer to the brake, and was a little longer. You can see right here that the tie rod is closer to the center of the ball joint. You know, it's angled in compared to the lower control arm, kind of. I don't know if y'all can see that. But what that changes, adjusting the length of your knuckle, adjusting the uh, forward and backward of the knuckle relative to the hub, um, changes up your Ackerman, okay? And this car right now in its current configuration scrubs really bad in parking lots. When you turn the Ackerman's a little bit off, um, I, or I guess it just has Ackerman in it. It doesn't have zero, so the wheels don't turn at the same rate effectively. Um, and I'm not going to even try to explain that to you guys because I don't know it well enough to be able to explain Ackerman to you. So that's the deal there. Now, I think these Flaming River racks work great with keeping the track width of the RX-7 because it looks like they are the proper length to what the uh, distance between the inner control arm mounts are, which is ideally if you keep the pivot point on the knuckle as close to the ball joint and the pivot point on the rack as close to the inner control arm pickup point, when you go through to your suspension travel, you won't have bump steer or minimal bump steer. So that's why these racks work good. Now, you can see back here, 
Let me grab my light. And this is something that for our Project 99, our, our secret project that I've got to build, but you can see back here that there's a really nice trick kind of muffler, exhaust hanger looking clamp bracket that holds the steering column and then allows for this double pivot um, shaft here. So this looks to be, I mean, that says Flaming River on it. This looks to just be Summit or Jegs racing, you know, Speedway, like Master Car style, universal components to make this work. Um, this is a fairly basic setup. So that's what's on the car currently. Now, I am going to drop a lot of this stuff out of here. I'm going to measure it. I want to get this drawn up in CAD because there's some improvements that I want to make to it just with how the engines are mounted and then also how this rear tension rod thing is set up. Um, but hopefully in the future, you know, and if you guys pester me enough, I want to build another one of these. If not, build or have a way to get this to you guys, you know, because I don't have experience with the black tie rack with the elite rack the other rack and pinion conversions for these cars but i've talked in depth to people who have and i don't like how flimsy they are they really are just like a band-aid for a bad steering box and you can't get bad can't get good steering boxes anymore um, i've got a video on how to adjust your steering box if you need to tighten up your steering but this is arguably the best rack opinion conversion for first gen. I mean, it's beefy, strong, it has no flex, it's safe, and safety is a huge part when it comes to steering. I mean, if you had seen, you know, I don't know where the videos are at or, you know, if you're on the Facebook groups or whatever, you know the guy that has basically flamed those guys that make those rack opinion conversions because the they've, they're flimsy. Like with the car on the ground with a grippy tire and he's turning the steering wheel, the whole rack moves side to side, and I'm just not into that. That's why I never bought one, never tried one. I like my stock drag link steering box setup for rally. It works just fine. I have plenty of spares. We might as well use it. And in the rally, you're driving in rocks anyway, so you can have loose steering, and you don't even feel it. But uh, this car will be a tarmac car, so the steering needs to be tight. It's a super quick rack. I think it's only a turn and a half or two turns, which is the total side to side, so Three quarter of a turn to the right, three quarter of a turn to the left, and that's all the your steering. So it's super quick. Um, but we'll get this front end apart, and I'll get this stuff out of here and measured up. We're not really changing anything in the front end besides brake pads for this build. Um, really, the only change is going to be that upper link. We'll do all new bushings in the back, just to make sure everything's healthy back there and nothing's loose. Get things clean. I hate working on dirty cars. I'm literally filthy. Um, and we'll get everything cleaned up. But that's the science on these suspension components as is. So we'll be doing, you know, checking the alignment and getting everything dialed on this car so we can take it to the track and be safe and, and go faster than the RX-8. So with that, Charles is probably going to run a different muffler because this has not good welds and not a lot of room. But with that, guys, I'm going to clean the shop up. And uh, tomorrow I've got to go film a video with the yellow FD. So that'll be Friday's video. If you haven't seen the yellow FD, the CYM, it is for sale. I'm bringing a trailer right now. Um, this is the second day of the auction when this video is going live. So go check that auction out. You know, if you like the car, this, that, and the other, share it with your buddies. You know somebody that's in the market for that. It's a really good car. But with that, guys, we're going to leave off here. I have a weekend worth of fixing bin rot, getting the rear end sorted, draining all the fuel out of that gas tank, getting the gas tank modified and in next week and uh, try to get this thing cranked out pretty quick. Some rust repair is just going to keep going on in the background, which is boring and monotonous work, but we will show it to you guys. So with that, thank you guys very much for watching. We'll see you guys in the next one. Comment below with any questions or like I said, your suspension setups, if you have good rack and pinion stuff or just good setups for the rear in general. And uh, I'd love to hear it. Keep it rad. We'll see you in the next one. Let's go find this dog. Dog! <whistles> Come here. Come here. I see you. Come here. So, guys, it's armadillo season in Tennessee, which it's always armadillo season. And the dog is the queen of chasing down armadillos. 
Hey, Letty, did you find me an armadillo? Did you find me an armadillo? Yeah. Did you find another one last week, too? Yeah. We getting all sorts of armadillos? Come on. Jump. Yeah. <laughs> Peace, guys.